Welcome to the 2016 Land Warfare Conference. Um, thanks in particular to the RSI, uh, RUSI and to Karen von Hippel for assembling an absolutely stellar cast of speakers this year. Thanks to Guy Swan, uh, as ever, and the Association of the US Army for your support, and of course to our sponsors. But importantly, thank you all for coming. I can't remember seeing this auditorium as full as it is today, so that's most impressive. And we are, as Karen suggested, looking for a rich debate this week. But it's also particularly reassuring to see so many of our international friends, given recent events. As far as we're concerned, there's absolutely no change to our army-to-army -army relations, and indeed to our many operational commitments and defence and security relationships. But we live in tumultuous times. It's difficult to remember a moment <clears throat> when the strategic context was more complex or dynamic. And as I said last year, we live in an era of constant competition warfare short of war, or what some are calling now the grey zone. Since I spoke, though, last year, the government has pegged defence expenditure at 2% of GDP and published the quinquennial Strategic Defence and Security Review. Our army emerged from that SCSR with a stated ambition to invest in the divisional level, a commitment to the concept of strike, a firm intent to deliver information manoeuvre through our ISR Brigade and 77 Brigade, a second division oriented towards persistent engagement overseas and meeting our standing operational commitments, an unprecedented emphasis on international partnership, a theme we shall develop tomorrow, and a very strong validation of Army 2020, with SDSR describing persistent engagement overseas as force driving, a clear recognition of the overlap between home and away, and an emphasis on homeland resilience. Now, throughout the debate leading up to the publication of SDSR, I think the defence community wrestled with the challenge of what was the most likely threat we should be structured to fight. The existential threat to the UK is probably not from Islamic extremism, nor is it the threat from imminent invasion. Rather, it's probably the incremental erosion of the rules-based global architecture that has assured our freedom, prosperity, and enviably open way of life since 1945. And of course, the one thing we can't be sure of is, that, or the one thing we can be sure of, is that we can't predict the future. And as Colin Gray wisely observed, most probably there are people writing today who have a clear and accurate vision of future warfare but we don't know who they are, nor do they. The trick is to be less wrong than one's opponent, while making sure one is able to recover quickly from the inevitable mistakes. As Sir Michael Howard once said, whatever doctrine the armed forces are working on, they've got it wrong. I'm also tempted to declare that it doesn't matter that they've got it wrong. What does matter is their capacity to get it right quickly when the moment arrives. And this conference and its theme is about unpacking that word capacity in all its guises, and particularly adaptability. And this really matters for us as soldiers. For in the land environment, there are many, many more variables than there are in air and maritime. Now, as the CGS, my immediate priorities today, the sort of fight tonight, as our American allies would describe it, are readiness and manning. But I'm going to focus now on the future. And the force structure that we'll have by 2025 is a pragmatic answer to that challenging strategic context and the remarkably diverse range of possible threats. We have attempted in designing that force structure to provide a foundation that is both adaptable and versatile, i.e. the ability to be able to adjust to new circumstances as well as having a reasonable range of capability. We intend to deliver two brigades at readiness from four, rather than one from three, one from three as today, partly because it's more productive, but also to provide more policy choice and more options to policymakers. Now, a significant change from the SDSR is that our defence planning assumptions no longer require the army to be structured to meet an enduring operation at medium scale in perpetuity. Rather, they now structure the army to fight, reorganising as necessary to meet these less demanding tasks. We warfight at the divisional level, 
So the division is at the heart of this adaptable structure. This is important because I think we have a tendency to disregard the command and control hierarchy and the increased wisdom that there is at each level. We tend to overcomplicate and to confuse accountability. We forget, I would suggest, that command and control is a capability in its own right. And in an era of campaigning, we bent our brigade structure out of shape. And I think it's worth reflecting on that structure and that hierarchy of wisdom contained in it to give emphasis to this point about the divisional level. It starts at the battle group level, the all arms grouping. In the British Army, at the brigade level, it is the level where we assure operational stability and we task organize to produce these battle groups. It's designed through the career structure, our education system, and the experience of the staff and the commander to be an organization that manages, handles a single tactical action at a time. We want it, therefore, to be agile and responsive. The division, though, which sits above it in that hierarchy of command and control wisdom, because of the additional training and experience of its staff and its commander, is where the full orchestra, as Field Marshal Slim described it, comes together. And it's the lowest level where operational art is practiced, where several tactical engagements are planned and executed in a potentially unlimited decision action cycle. Increasingly, it's where the expertise from the full joint interagency and wider non-kinetic areas are routinely integrated. And it's where the enablers that allow maneuver to be executed with an operational framework by more than one formation is routinely commanded and integrated. Hence, our Headquarters 3 Division is designed to be integrated, scalable, modular, and capable of distributed command. And that's increasingly popular, uh, po uh, possible given the nature of information. And it provides adaptability for a range of different contingencies. But importantly, the idea behind this division is it also brings reference customer status, both for our allies, but importantly also for our potential enemies. It underpins the credibility of an army. In the UK, I emphasize, it's the lowest level where we would warfight, and indeed where we would take the risks associated with that. But it also provides a framework in which we're able to integrate other nations, like our joint expeditionary force partners. I'll return to that. That said, it's debatable, I would suggest, whether our division at the moment is sufficiently versatile, given the evolving character of conflict and the need to rebuild capability after a decade or so of campaigning. We are currently reworking its structure around a ground maneuver element of two armored infantry brigades and an Ajax-equipped strike brigade. And along with many other armies, I would suggest, that have been committed to counterinsurgency recently, we have some obvious capability shortfalls. We're doing much on protection our Warrior Upgrade Programme and our Challenger 2 Life Extension Programme will deal with some of those challenges. But in fires and counterfires, I think there's much that we need to do. During counterinsurgency, we emphasised and privileged precision over the ability to neutralise, and I suspect the mass of fires is something we need to reflect on. Air defence is an area where there is acknowledged weakness. I think if we're lucky, we might get air parity. And the Falklands, of course, in 1982 was instructive, where some one-third of our sentries and our machine guns were pointed upwards rather than outwards. We've got work to do on mobility and counter-mobility, and we've got work to do on cyber and electromagnetic activity. And the extent to which, as an army, we understand the reversionary skills that are necessary in the event of all of that information space not being available to us is, I think, food for thought. And, of course, we've had a generation of people who've grown up in counterinsurgency and have not been educated and trained in the concept of combined arms manoeuvre. It's not a question of forgetting it, it's a question of never having done it. Now, we acknowledge these deficiencies and these capability shortfalls. And this weekend, for example, Headquarters 3 Division will wargame our evolving structure and test it thoroughly against two demanding scenarios so that we understand the shortfalls. But I think like all Western armies at the moment, we would acknowledge that mass, or a lack of mass, is probably the greatest challenge. How do we deal with that problem? 
And I think it's quite instructive. We will commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Sol the Somme on Friday. And I think it's helpful because it reminds us, I suspect, that we also need to be prepared to fight the war we might have to fight, not necessarily the, for the war that we would like to fight. Because in so doing, and in so being prepared to do that, there's a reasonable chance we might deter it from happening. But a big deduction one would draw from that is this issue of mass and resilience. Hence, it's vital that we understand how we would regenerate and reconstitute. And that's why our Army Reserve and our Army Regular Reserve are important to us. And one of the advantages of these new defence planning assumptions is it allows us to think more from first principles about what the role of the Army Reserve should be. You'll recall that a year ago, given the defence planning assumptions, it was there very much to backfill and integrate a regular structure which was designed to manage an enduring operation in perpetuity. Now it is there for reconstitution and regeneration. It is there in the event of a nationally recognised emergency. Now that's not to say that reservists are not able to take their part if they can afford the time and the effort to be able to uh, deploy alongside the regular component. <clears throat> but they are there if true obligation terms for worst case. Now that is proving to be easier to recruit for, a point I shall come back to. The other thing I think we mustn't lose sight of if you need to regenerate or reconstitute is the importance of your generating force. We used to think of this as an overhead, but if you're going to regrow an army, the extent to which your training organisation is able to regenerate the army is absolutely vital. We also, I think, need to think hard about how we squeeze the maximum utility out of all of our manpower. And increasingly, I'm convinced that we should be thinking about end strength, not just being about the output of our regular full-time forces, but rather all of those in uniform. That's particularly relevant when you think about how much the reserve delivers us now by way of specialist capability. Arguably, some 75 to 80 percent of our medical capability is contained in the reserve. And there are a huge number of other specialisms which we draw from the reserve because we cannot afford to have them on the full-time strength. So simply thinking about our output on the basis of it being 82,000 regulars, I sense is not as productive as it should be. And indeed, one of the announcements in the SDSR was this idea of a flexible engagement system where one would look at the degree of commitment across a spectrum from full to part-time service and therefore think increasingly about an end strength of the army as probably being nearer 120,000 rather than the way it's currently specified. And of course this allows us to think hard about what we call type B reservists. And 77 Brigade is a very interesting model where you can draw in some quite interesting capabilities from the outside world to help you in social media, in information warfare, and so on and so forth. And that, I suggest, might provide us with an offset strategy, given that it is very challenging for us now to buy that in ourselves permanently, rather that network that goes out into the outside world provides us, I suggest, with the capability we need. I think we've also, and I keep saying this, but I really mean it this time, need to open the aperture of our imagination on sponsored reserves. We need to think about it, I would suggest, on more of a capability-based way, not just talk about a whole force approach. For example, there's a lot more I think we can do in terms of the generating force with training in partnership with industry. And when we look at some of the capabilities that will enter service over the next 10 years, the replacement for our logistic platform known as DROPS, the palletized load system, that is an area where if we think about it more laterally with industry, I suspect we can come forward with an innovative solution that sees not just the vehicle, but the support solution, the infrastructure, and in particular, the people line of development, the drivers of this equipment, perhaps being produced from industry in a whole force approach that encourages innovation and possibly automation as well. Now, as an offset strategy to this lack of mass, we should be in no doubt that it is being international by design, as our SDSR described, where we will find the mass that we need. That's partly about being engaged overseas, which I'll come back to, but rather, for my mind, it's about where we go with interoperability. And for the British Army, we look through the arc for interoperability. Increasingly, we look to our joint expeditionary force for interoperability, that club of northern European nations that have come together under our framework, Norway, the Netherlands, Denmark, and the Baltic states, 
And through that, my sense is that we'll be able to invest in real interoperability, which will produce, over time, secure voice, a common operating picture, and importantly, the ability to share digital files. And we'll do this bilaterally with the United States, with France, and with Germany, I guess. And it's really important in the future that we give real meaning to interoperability and achieve the sort of output that we eventually achieved in Afghanistan. Now that brings me on to information manoeuvre, another outcome of the SDSR. And it seems to me that the pace of change in the information environment forces constant adaptation. Integrated action is now the Army's core doctrine. I talked about this last year, but we should remember that it recognises, first and foremost, that success is now easier to achieve through the integration of soft through to hard power. That's how it will happen. Rarely is there a purely military solution. Victory is invariably defined by the triumph of the narrative, and the audience often has the decisive vote. Now, 77 Brigade is an evolving capability, and it is beginning to change the way our army thinks about manoeuvre. And its mission is to take forward this idea, this core doctrine of integrated action, to maintain or change behaviour through non-kinetic means. And it's now corralled all of our non-kinetic force structure into a coherent whole in order to achieve this output. With it, one ISR brigade is designed to bring coherence to a range of capabilities that were previously organized into tribal groupings. It's driven modernization and improvement, and it's provided a docking point for our joint and interagency capability. But these two formations are really only the first steps towards the establishment of a new information maneuver formation that will include our two signal brigades as well. Information services need to be delivered differently. We need to think more about how we look at it functionally, the distinction between, on the one hand, infrastructure and networks, as distinct, on the other, from information management, applications, and cyber and electromagnetic activity. This, I think, will open up the opportunity for us to think very differently about how we man this increasingly specialized area. And there are weak signals that we need to think hard about how we man our signals brigades. Now, SDSR also identified defense engagement overseas as a force driving task. In other words, one that resources would be applied to. And it recognized the reducing distinction, therefore, between home and away. Now, this builds on the Army 2020 deduction that persistent engagement contributes to insight and understanding, it shapes events, it provides deterrence and reassurance, and if targeted effectively, it can enhance our national prosperity. But importantly, what it also does is it enhances our readiness and our adaptability, as the French demonstrated a few years ago in Mali. If you've got the feel for what happens, you can respond quickly and you can take what appears to be great risk. Hence the role of our first division, with its brigades aligned to specific regions and countries. And last year alone, some 26,500 foreign troops were trained in some 39 countries by British soldiers from the first division. But we've learned, I think, over the last three years, that we need bespoke structures to do some of this overseas capacity building. And hence the announcement in the SDSR of five specialized infantry battalions. That title is a placeholder. They may become something different in due course. But for the moment, it's a recognition that our conventional infantry achieved significantly more than might have been expected during Afghanistan, and that we need to give them the opportunity to continue to deliver something well above the conventional task. These battalions will be smaller, some 300 strong, and they will be designed to train, advise, assist, and where appropriate, accompany indigenous forces, thus taking perhaps greater risk than conventional infantry might have to take. And, of course, they will major on language and cultural expertise. They'll be rolled out from next year through a series of pilots, and the goal is that they should be able to deliver capacity building at a higher end than just straight conventional infantry. Now, I don't want to situate the appreciation in terms of what we will conclude during the course of the next couple of days, but I suspect that we will deduce 
that adaptability depends hugely on institutional agility and organizing for it. I talked last year about the importance of the army being match fit to run the business. And I talked about defense reform giving the army significant financial autonomy. This opportunity has required us to reorganize our operating model to ensure we run the business better and become a better customer of our many interlocutors, both within defense and outside defense. However, it is also a model that is designed to make us more institutionally adaptive and agile, to force decision-making on the right horizon, not close in, but further out. The challenge, of course, we found, and I guess it's the same with a number of major institutions, is how to ensure that decision-making is informed with the right input supplied with the right human capacity. So I suspect that we will also conclude during the course of the next couple of days, that adaptability can only be achieved through privileging the conceptual component of fighting power. It's about brains, it's about culture, and it's about how we maximize available talent. And I would encourage you, when you get a moment outside this hall, to visit the adjacent and adjoining halls where some of this is explored. Importantly, I hope that we will examine what all this means and that we will draw some conclusions about the importance of learning, particularly from our mistakes. Hence, the establishment of our Centre for Historical Analysis and Conflict Research. But also about the value of experimentation and concept demonstrators being available on the shelf when you need them. About decentralisation, timing and tempo. And about where the cursor should sit between training and education. As Eric Hoffer put it the other day, education should implant a will and a facility for learning. It should produce not learned, but learning people. In times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. I hope we will also deduce the importance of a command-led culture, which leads to more agile decision-making, about creating the environment in which we allow honest mistakes in pursuit of calculated risk-taking on the battlefield, and above all, about the importance these days of leadership. So, I much look forward to the next couple of days. Uh, I shall pull it together at the end and take questions at that point um, after lunch tomorrow. But in the meantime, I look forward to what I really do think is a stellar gathering of speakers and I very much hope that all of you from the floor will participate, particularly given the encouragement that Karen gave us earlier. So thank you very much.